Let's start with a prayer. We pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious God, we lift our hearts as we gather in your house, in this sacred space, mindful of your blessings, mindful of your presence, mindful of your call, mindful of the ways that you make yourself known to us in so many ways throughout our lives. We praise you for the gift, the many gifts of your sacramental presence to us. Pray for your spirit to be upon us tonight, to open our minds and our hearts to the beauty, to the significance, to the immense meaning of every aspect of our worship, especially as it pertains to the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Pray for your spirit to be with me, that my words might be your words, that all that I might speak to might be in accordance with your will. I pray for your spirit through the intercession of our Blessed Mother, who always points us in the direction of your son's will, of her son's will. As we pray, come Holy Spirit, come by the most powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, your well-beloved spouse. Come, Holy Spirit, come by the most powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, your well-beloved spouse. Come, Holy Spirit, come by the most powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, your well-beloved spouse. St. John the Baptist, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So just a couple of disclaimers as we begin this evening. Um, this whole idea actually originates from something that I've been doing with the RCIA candidates uh, throughout many years of my priesthood in various parishes that I've been. Uh, so originally it was something that I kind of started doing just in, in a way to speak to them about the meaning behind so many aspects of the Mass. Uh, so that's kind of the, the gauge of tonight, in a sense, um, perhaps for some of you, what I might speak to might be uh, super basic, um, but I think for all of us, there's always things that are an opportunity for refreshment when it comes to our experience of the liturgy. That being said, uh, the plan, which you may or may not have known, is my plan is to go for about 90 minutes this evening, uh, and within the context of that, to actually celebrate uh, a Mass. Uh, we call it a teaching Mass, but I do it probably differently than some priests. Um, I don't necessarily love the idea of breaking apart all of the actual prayers as I go through them, just because I think there's an integrity to the beauty of the Mass, and I don't necessarily like to tear it apart and when, when we're actually celebrating it. Um, and so my mode is I'm going to say a lot right now, and then we're going to start Mass, and then I'll say a little bit more during the homily, and then time willing, uh, I'm going to uh, say a little bit at the end as well. Uh, some, I, I heard the question, Father, you spent a lot of time last year on the introductory rites and the Liturgy of the Word and kind of shortchanged the Liturgy of the Eucharist. I did last year. I probably will this year. Um, I will touch on a couple of points from the Liturgy of the Eucharist, but um, with the entirety of this, actually, I mean, 90 minutes may sound like a long time, but it really, just in a very basic way, deserves probably at least three hours, and three hours actually only allows me to speak about, <laughs> speak about some of the elements of the Mass. I mean, I could do 90 minutes on one of the Eucharistic prayers, and I know some are like, well, why don't you do that? Um, maybe. But uh, I've been doing this, this, I don't know how many, 20, 25 times in my priesthood, um, and it always kind of falls the same that I say too much at the beginning and then have to like get along with it, and then we run out of time, and that's pretty much 
what's going to happen tonight. So, uh, I would actually like to do a part two. I'm hoping to, to do a part two and actually formulate what exactly that would look like and how that would fall. Um, but anyway, uh, we are live streaming tonight, so uh, there might be an opportunity to go back and listen to something that you missed. It's going to be on the, or the parish uh, Facebook page is where it's being live streamed to, which can be accessed through the parish website. Um, so we invite her, I welcome all of those joining us from all, all throughout the world. It's great to have you tonight. Uh, <clears throat> so that being said, there is books and books and books that have been written and that can be written about what we do as Catholics in the context of the liturgy, specifically that we call the Mass. Um, and unfortunately, yeah, we're going to just brush the surface tonight. I do hope to have an opportunity for some questions, and it may have to be like after, after time or whatever, um, but we'll see how it goes. A, a couple of ways that I'd like to start, because especially with RCIA, of, of all of the ways that we worship as Catholics, one of the basic, most fundamental realities that I would say makes us somewhat different than so many denominations of Christianity is the reality that we believe in the immense dignity and beauty, not only of our spirit. So obviously, when it comes to prayer, our spirit is drawn up in worship. But we also see the immense dignity and beauty of the body. And the fact that God did not just make us spirit, but that we're also bodies. And the significance of our bodies also being drawn into our worship. And so what we'll come to find out and what many of you know as Catholics is the reality that every gesture, every posture, every position, every element, even every little symbol within the context of the church, even the architectural layout of the church has a deeper meaning. And that's why I say I could go on and on, and I will, um, but hopefully not beyond the 90 minutes. But the reality of every aspect, we believe in the immense significance of not only our spirits being lifted up, but also the significance of our bodies entering into worship. I talk about that in the, in the context of even Jesus' teaching. As he went around teaching, as he went around healing, so many times in the context of his healing, he could have he snapped his fingers, he could have just thought the healing, and it would have been so. He certainly knew people's thoughts. He, he certainly, as God, could have, could have done it that way. But so many times he uses material things to carry out this sort of spiritual reality that was taking place. He didn't have to spit in the dirt to make a little bit of a sad mud that he rubbed on somebody's face. But that's one of the ways he healed. Because there's something tangible about the fact that we are created in bodies and that we use the material as a means of lifting our hearts and our spirits to that which we cannot see. That's, in a very simple way, a definition of what sacraments are. Is visible, sensual is a word that I often use, which has kind of been kind of uh, stolen from our culture, sensual, which simply just means of the senses, a way to encounter those things that we cannot see through our senses. So all of the sacraments have those elements of the physical world element, water and bread and wine and oils and fire and so many different 
so many different physical things that draw us into a deeper understanding and meaning of the spiritual, of what's taking place, what we cannot see. And so, obviously, the Mass is steeped in the visual, in the posture, in all of those, so many, so many of those elements. The danger that that carries with it, because there is a danger of us not only being spiritual worshipers, but also bodily worshipers, is when you start to do stuff with your body, and you do it enough times with your body, what happens? It starts to become a routine. It starts to become a habit. What happens when things become a habit? Then we sometimes disconnect our brains, our hearts, from what we're doing. I know that probably isn't the case with all of you. I'm being sarcastic because it's the case with it's the case with all of us. From, from the very gesture of entering into the church, into the physical church. I don't know if you dipped your hand in the common water bowl and splashed some on yourself. Did you think about that? What you were doing there? If you're a normal Catholic, there's a chance that you didn't because of that tendency of habit sort of taking over. But that's one of the thing, I think one of the beauties of things like this is an opportunity to be reminded of what we already know, what we've, what we've already learned, and to sort of just be reminded of those things because of the deep and immense power that they contain and meaning that they contain. So certainly, as, as many of you already know, those fonts are filled with the holy water, which is the reminder of our baptism. And the reality is that in ancient times, even before you could enter into worship in a Catholic space, before you could technically walk into the formal church, you had to go through the waters of baptism. And that's why in many places, the waters of baptism are outside of the sanctuary, outside of the worship space, towards the entryway, or even set apart from the entryway. And so even just in the basic layout of the church, there's a deeper meaning speaking to what we're doing here. That by our baptism we have become sons and daughters of God, have entered into that relationship with God, and therefore it is right and just that we are here in this space. And when we mark ourselves every time we come into church, is supposed to be that reminder that we've been marked in Jesus Christ through the waters of baptism, and that we're entering into his house, but also our family house. So that's as the, the entryway of the church, even before that, and I'm going to make, make reference to just a couple of the architectural elements of a church, um, <clears throat> because even those carry, carry significance in terms of what we're doing here. So traditionally, the church, like this church, has stairs on the outside coming up, which is not very handicap thoughtful. And is that just because we're inconsiderate as Catholics? <coughs> Even the idea of elevating the space of the church carries a deep significance to the scriptural reality of worship. In the Old Testament, when you wanted to encounter God, even in the New Testament, some of the encounters with Jesus Christ, the transfiguration, the Beatitudes, the sermon, his, his most famous sermon, is the Sermon on the Mount, the transfiguration happens on the mount in the Old Testament. So many of the altars and the places of encounter with God happened on the mount. And so while we are desiring to spiritually be lifted up, we're also physically lifting ourselves up. 
So the elevation of the Catholic Church is to lead us into that mentality that we're going up to meet the Lord. We're going up to this encounter with the Lord and the deep significance of that. And it doesn't stop out there. That elevation element continues here. Not to the stage, even though sometimes I think that's how it's sort of perceived, that's where the drama takes place. We gotta, we gotta reclaim that mentality as well. But the elevation continues as you come to the sanctuary, that word simply meaning holy space, a space set apart, sang, sanctus, comes from the same root word, holy sanctuary. And so typically then there's steps leading up to the sanctuary, steps to the altar, and then steps traditionally leading up to the place of reservation of the Lord in the tabernacle sort of the highest place, kind of reminiscent back to the Holy of Holies in the temple, the dwelling place of God. And so physically in that way, we're going up to the encounter with God. And it's a beautiful image too, because when we come to Mass, hopefully that's not only what we're spiritually trying to do, but that's why we physically do it. We step out of the world. We step, we're supposed to step out of what's going on out there. We're supposed to leave that down, down there and come up to the place of encounter with God. That should always be our prayer as we, as we come in and, and spend a few moments, hopefully, prior to Mass, is, is, is praying that God might take the cares and the concerns and the anxieties and all of those things that burden us and weigh us down that we might leave those out there as we come into the dwelling place of God. Even the place where you're seated. I know some of these things I've talked about in homilies, so you remember it all, right? It's called the nay. If I see a couple of people mouthing the answer, good job. The nay, which stems from the same word as one of the military branches, the Navy, um, which actually just means boat or ship. The nave of the church, actually in the traditional layout of the structure, is to resemble, resemble a boat. That you gather in the boat. This is a kind of another image of stepping out of the chaos in the Bible, right? In the Gospels, it's, the, it's always the apostles in the boat. And inevitably, if they're in the boat, it's never, a, they were out in the boat and it was a beautiful day. It's not, that's never the case. I never really thought about that before, actually, but there's always chaos. It's always a storm. And a beautiful, beautiful image of gathering into the boat, stepping out of the storms that are going on out there, and entering into the boat. Because that's where the, oftentimes the encounter with Jesus took place. Sometimes he was, he was asleep, but the reality of Jesus' presence. And so even the nave is in the basic layout of a boat as the place where the people gather. I speak to the reality of the vaulted ceilings of churches. Some people say, you know, it's a lot of wasted space. Before we talk to the beauty of that, I want to talk to the great traditional symbolism of the scaffolding. <laughs> Just kidding. Sadly, the scaffolding is interfering with my talk tonight. So I'd like to point you to some of the beautiful windows. Um, but the reality of the layout of the upper area of the traditional church, all of the elements, the colors, the images, are all heavenly things, saints, angels, blues, golds, stars, all of those images.
images, the beauty of those images, lifting our minds and our hearts to the fact that this encounter is not just a worldly encounter, it's not just a gathering of people to come to socialize, to visit with your friends and your family members, it's not just a horizontal relationship gathering, but it's a divine gathering. And the church is laid out to draw us into that image. And so, yes, your mind is, your, your eyes are supposed to be drawn up to the beauty, to the significance of the heavenly realities when we look to the ceiling of a Catholic church, to the windows of a Catholic church. And so that's the significance of the saints that line the windows of our church and those upper windows. It's a reminder that we're gathering here on earth, but it's not just an earthly gathering. Every Mass, there is this connection, this mysterious connection with the heavenly realities. We don't just sing about it as some some saying or phrase, the, the feast of heaven and earth, but it is the reality of what we actually believe. I always speak to that, especially with those who have lost loved ones. There is no place on earth, perhaps one could argue that the cemetery is actually the place where we can kind of encounter them in a unique way, but more profound than that because we believe that their spirits are no longer there at the cemetery. That the heavenly realities, the prayer of the Mass, is the most close that you can possibly be to your, to your loved ones who have died. There's no place that we can be closer to them in prayer and in worship than in the context of the Mass. That's what the windows, in a sense, are supposed to sim symbolize. That the angels and the saints gather with us in worship. And our prayers say the same. And so the physical layout, the architecture of the traditional Catholic Church carries a deep meaning. I mean, an entire talk could be on just the architecture of this church. And I've already used 23 minutes. And I haven't even talked about the Mass yet. That's how it goes. And so the beauty of all of those pieces are what are supposed to lead our bodies into the worship that we are about to encounter in the Mass. And so we, as I already made reference to, we sign ourselves with the waters of our baptism. We come to the pew and we check in, right? You know how you check in when you, got, you get to church and you get to your pew. You got to check in, which is do this. Did you know that the genuflection has nothing to do with your pew? Even though sometimes Catholics, like, they only genuflect when they come to the pew. But if we enter into any Catholic church that we're visiting, that actually should be the first gesture that we do has nothing to do with the pew, has everything to do with what we believe is up there in the tabernacle. The real presence of our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. And so that's obviously, as many of you know, what that gesture is about. In the scriptures, it's at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every knee shall bend. So we believe in the immense presence of Jesus. This ancient sign of worship is done before our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. And so, yeah, if you have no intention to going into a pew and you're just visiting a Catholic church, it's still extremely important and proper to genuflect upon entry and upon exiting the church. In fact, the immense reverence of what we believe is there and how we believe Jesus is here used to be 
And this is another piece of architecture, and I talked about it a few weeks ago in one of my homilies. Used to be that any time we would even pass by the tabernacle, if we were in the church and we were looking at the windows over here and then we were going over here to look at the windows, that our reminder of reverence is always centered on Jesus Christ, really and truly present, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the tabernacle. So much so that it was a sacred space that was reserved for the ministers of the Eucharist. I think we've lost a little bit of that. I experience it perhaps most profoundly when I do like weddings and funerals and there's this loss of a sense of the sacredness of the space and especially I think instilled in kids. And this isn't necessarily a reprimand of parents, but I think it's obviously a loss of sacredness in so many ways and so many places throughout our world today. But that separation used to be by the fact that there was a rail on the edge of the sanctuary. That wasn't just a, okay, this is the place for the holy people, and you guys stay out there. Had nothing to do necessarily with the minister, the priest. Had everything to do with the place of the dwelling of God and the place that we go to encounter God. And I know, again, I talked about this in a homily a few weeks ago, but how beautiful and sometimes I think how lost is the reminder of the image that how profound it was that we, we typically don't enter the dwelling place of God up here. That maybe there's a particular situation or that we might be doing something, but that this, the space was reserved, not as a place, not just steps to kind of climb up and down or to allow the kids to run around on. But that we would only approach it and come to the edge of it and then fall on our knees. And that was the last gesture that we did. And God did the rest. And that's the image of communion at the rail was then the minister would bring Jesus to us and in that position of receptivity we would simply allow Jesus to make the last move. We wouldn't reach out, we wouldn't pincer, we wouldn't grab him, but that he would make the move to us as we opened our bodies to receive. And so again, another piece of the traditional architecture that was torn out because we're, we don't want the separation, we don't want the, perhaps the clericalism or whatever might have been the reasoning. And I think as a result, have lost a little bit of the sense of the sacredness of this space of the dwelling place of God. And so that genuflection again, drawing back into the entry into the church, the symbolism, the significance, is always about Jesus and the tabernacle. So if you come into a Catholic church and there's not a tabernacle that's visible and you don't know where it is, you don't really need to genuflect because that's a sign of reverence specifically for Jesus and the Blessed Sacrament. If the tabernacle is in the room off to the side and you know that to be the case, your genuflection actually should be towards that room off to the side. Because the genuflection again is about the fact that he's here in a tabernacle wherever that tabernacle might be. Has nothing to do with the pew. If the tabernacle is open and there's no candle lit, Good Friday is really like the main one when this is the case, then we don't, we don't genuflect. The only excuse that one would have is if the cross that will be used for veneration is out, that's the one day of year of the year where we venerate the cross with a genuflection. 
So you might be like, oh, I was, I was, genuf I was genuflecting to the cross. It wasn't a forced path, Father. I, I, don't, I don't say that in judgment either, because there's been multiple times on Good Friday where I genuflected in the church, and Jesus is not here. But anyways. And so the beauty of even the signs of reverence of how we enter into worship through our body. The beginning of Mass. 30 minutes. The procession. So the opening hymn. Traditionally, the opening hymn was actually a text from the Missal called the Entrance Antiphon. And it was specifically chosen scriptural scripture that ties into either the feast, the season, or the particular liturgy that's being celebrated. So every Mass that we celebrate has an entrance antiphon that traditionally was chanted as a drawing us into the specifics of that Mass or the particular season that we're celebrating. There's been a bit of a shift to the, the hymns being sung, and I think there's certainly some hymns that carry the same, some of the same meanings in terms of drawing us into the particulars of the season or the particulars of that mass. Um, but that's why if you hear like that verse that's chanted at the beginning of mass, it's not just a random thing that the canter thought they would do but it's actually specifically an assigned entrance antiphon for that particular mass. And oftentimes there would have been an antiphonal singing of that as part of the procession and the entry into mass. The procession itself, you stand up, right? And you know why you stand up in that moment? Because it used to be that the, when, when important people entered the room, that you would stand in reverence of them. So like technically if the bishop enters the room, you would te technically you're supposed to stand. It used to be that when a woman entered the room, out of respect for her dignity, that the gentleman at the table or the people would stand. Um, and so because of the significance of the priest, it's kind of a big deal to stand up, right? No. That's not why you stand at the beginning of Mass. And the procession of the priest and the ministers coming forward is not just, oh, I was out there gathering and, and greeting people and I need to find a way to get to the front for Mass, so why don't you sing a song and give me some traveling music? No, it's actually intimately tied into the idea of procession. Every Mass begins with a procession. In fact, some of the Masses in various liturgies throughout the year actually have a full-scale procession where people gather somewhere else and then with the ministers actually process into the church. That's, that's actually, in a sense, the most appropriate way to enter into Mass because it's that reminder that we are pilgrims. We're on a journey. Yes, in the context of this Mass, but specifically throughout our lives, we are pilgrims on a journey, and the procession, in a sense, is a reminder to that at the very outset of the Mass, that we're not made for this world. We're simply processing through. Who do we follow behind in procession? It's why the crucifix leads the way. As we follow behind Jesus. He leads, leads the way in the procession. And so standing is sort of the remnant of the participation in that, that procession, reminding us that we are also processing through this life to eternity with God. So that from the outset is sort of the first gesture of the mountains. And then we begin 
by signing ourselves with the sign of our salvation, the cross, the most basic but perhaps most profound prayer. There's books that are, that are written about the sign of the cross. And one thing that I would say with the sign of the cross is that gesture is again the mark of our baptism when we were signed in the cross of Jesus Christ, a reminder of that. But it is profoundly significant, even within the context of, of spiritual warfare, the spiritual battle that we believe is rampant in the world around us. There's perhaps no more profound a prayer when experiencing temptation, when experiencing spiritual attack, than to sign ourselves in our salvation in Jesus Christ and to pray the, the sign of the cross. Now I know there's all kinds of other prayers that were given that are means of spiritual battle, spiritual warfare, and those are all great. But if we're at a loss, that's a good place to start, is the sign of the cross, the most fundamental but universal prayer that we have as Catholics. Much could be said about that, but moving on to then the greeting of the priest, the beginning of Mass, something to the effect of, the Lord be with you. Very nice, very nice, exactly. I love, I love doing that in a crowd of Catholics when you're not like in the context of the Mass, and you're just like, the Lord be with you, and you will get an automatic response. And that's awesome. The one of the biggest critiques that we get as Catholics is why don't you have Bibles in the pews? Why don't you why do you have all these man-made prayers? Why don't you use the scriptures more in your worship? Let me assure you. Almost every word of the Mass has its foundations from somewhere in the Scriptures. The very first words of the priest after the sign of the cross are an exact recitation of the greeting of St. Paul in his letters. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit is not just something that the Church came up with but as a quotation of his letter, of St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, of his greeting. The immense and steeped presence of the scriptures within our Catholic worship is huge. I'll speak to that a little bit more in a second. And so I think that's something that we have to become more aware of. And there's actually a lot of cool websites that have like a breakdown of all of the different prayers and where you can find sort of direct correlations and indirect correlations within the context of the Bible. But from the very beginning, the priest greets in the exact words of St. Paul. And it's not just a, hey, how you doing? I don't just say, and that's one of the reasons why even the wording was changed in the in the new translation. That the greeting of the priest is acknowledging God's presence in you, and that your response is and with your spirit, not just and also with you. Because you're not just reciprocating a hey, how's it going? But you're actually acknowledging. The fact that the priest, in the context of the Mass, is standing in the person of Jesus Christ by the very fact of his ordination. And so it's an acknowledgement of the spirit of the priest, who is the one presiding over worship. Again, it's, it's not about the dignity of the priest, per se, as much as it is who he represents in this worship gathering. So it's, and with your spirit. 
And then as I love to talk about, probably one of my favorite things to talk about, and I know I've talked about it in multiple homilies, the first sort of formal request of the priest upon the behalf of the people in the context of the liturgy is something to the effect of, in case you're feeling good about yourselves, in case you're happy with how you're doing, why don't you spend some time, time thinking about your sins, sinners. I think of all of the things that are bizarre in Catholic worship, to me that's like one of the one of the ones that slaps me across the face from the very outset. The very first thing that we do in the context of the worship is the priest says, think about your sins. I don't know if any other church starts that way. Maybe they do. Um, why? Well, the idea, and this goes all the way through the Old Testament, is that in order to enter into right worship with God, there, I mean, in, in the Old Testament, it was an, an immense right of purification of oneself prior to even attempting to enter into worship of God. And so the idea with the penitential rite is that before we do anything else, before we attempt to allow the scriptures to penetrate our hearts, before we even think about approaching our Lord in the most blessed sacrament, we have to first assess all of the baggage and the wounds and the anxieties and the sins all of the junk that we're all carrying all the time. And so the very first thing is almost in a sense of saying, there's really no reason to continue in this worship if we don't first assess our need for God. And it's a communal thing. Thankfully, the priest doesn't pick out individual people. You're going to need to think about your sins in particular today. We all have to assess our fallen nature and the fact that we need God. And so that's what the penitential rite is, is an assessment of our sin. And we should actually strive to enter into a little reflection upon our sin. It's funny because when, when I'm up here talking about the Mass, the phrases that we say like thousands of times in our priesthood, I can never, <laughs> I can never call them to mind like on point. Like, <sighs> so I'm just going to pass over that because I can't remember the phrase. <laughs> Anyways, <clears throat> but the priest ends that little time of reflection, and it should be, I mean, it should be a little bit of a time of reflection on our sins. That's kind of a pet peeve of mine is that the priest says, you know, let us prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. Let us call to mind our sins. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Almighty God, have mercy. I mean, it's just like sort of skimmed over without even allowing for an opportunity to pause and to consider the sins that weigh heavy on us. And then that prayer of absolution, there is actually within the context of the penitential rite, the priest prays a prayer of, a, a small prayer of absolution. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. We do believe to carry the absolution of God for venial, for venial sin. Now within the context of the Mass, we believe in the forgiveness of venial sin in that absolution prayer. And that if there's grave sin, that that, before we would attempt to encounter our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, before we would attempt to receive Him in Holy Communion, that we would receive forgiveness from that sacramentally.
but I'm getting ahead of myself. And so the priest prays that prayer of absolution, and the people on, it, on any given Sunday or throughout the season of Easter, your response to the forgiveness of God's sin is something to the effect of You know that the Gloria is placed precisely where it is for a particular reason, that upon the forgiveness of our sins, it makes total sense that we would sing glory and honor to God in response. And so the Gloria is specifically set after the penitential rite as an opportunity to glorify God for his mercy, for his love, for the fact that he welcomes us into this worship. And then the conclusion of the Gloria is what is called the Collect Prayer. Often you hear opening prayer. And again, the Collect Prayer typically is steeped in scriptural reference, but it is meant to collect, collect our thoughts and sort of gear them and direct them into the liturgy of the Word. So often the Collect Prayer and this is a challenge because we have a three-year cycle, and there's only one collect prayer, and so it oftentimes will reference scriptures from maybe one of the cycles of readings, but not all of them. So they don't always directly relate to the specific, but they do relate to the scriptural readings that we are entering into. That collect prayer is supposed to collect our thoughts and direct us into the liturgy of the Word. And so while we've been standing for all of these parts because we're participating through our prayer, through our words, at the time of the liturgy of the word, we are seated because that's the position of receiving. And so we sit for the liturgy of the word. I made reference to it. So I, yeah, I know, part six. Uh, we'll be here every Monday night for the next. <laughs> uh, so, the liturgy of the word, what I'll say about the liturgy of the word is again going back to that critique that we receive as Catholics is why don't you read from the scriptures? Is in the context of three years. And if you were to go to Mass every day for the daily Mass readings, which is on a two-year cycle, and in the context of three years, where the Sunday readings are in a three-year cycle, if you were to do that, you would receive the in entirety of the message of our salvation history. And a significant part of many of the parts of the Old Testament, the Psalms, and the New Testament. And my challenge is always is to show me a denomination of Christianity that is hearing more of the scriptures proclaimed in the scheme of three years than our Catholics. And I don't just say that as a was a like a boast. Recognize. I say that because I think a lot of Catholics don't realize that. That in the context of our three-year cycle of scripture readings for the Sundays throughout the year, we are, we are receiving an immense amount of the scriptures. The reason that it's put into a missalette is the idea that it makes it easier to follow the readings as we go through. Is it okay to bring your Bible and follow the scriptures that way? Two thumbs up. Go for it. Go for it. Um, in fact, you know, I think one of the most profound things that you can do in preparation for Sunday Sunday Mass is actually read the readings ahead of time. I don't. I don't think there's anything more profound that you can do in preparation for Sunday Mass than that, because inevitably, when you've read them ahead of time, when they're proclaimed from the ambo. If, if you're like me and can kind of sometimes zone out, 
I mean, I used to, obviously, before I was a priest. If you've heard it before, if it's familiar to you, if you've just read it a couple of days ago, it'll draw you back in. You'll, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I read this. Oh, yeah, I, re I reflected on it. And it draws us back in to those readings. We always have, except for the season of Easter, typically then an Old Testament reading, then a reading from the Psalms, then one of the epistle readings of either St. Paul or the other epistles, and then a gospel passage from one of the four gospels. As I've spoken of before, the, the cycles are in accordance with the synoptic gospels. Sorry, I pause on that word because my scripture background was horrible, even when I went to seminary. Like, I went to my, I went, <laughs> this is why it takes so long. Uh, I went to my interview for seminary. I can't believe I'm saying this on live stream, that's awesome. And then one of the questions was, now, in your understanding, how, how is, why is there a difference between the synoptic gospels and John's gospel? And I have never heard the word synoptic gospels in my formation to the point of going to seminary. And I don't say that to shame you if you've never heard it, because it's not something that's frequently talked about unless you've entered into study of the scriptures and the gospels. Easy way to remember that, synoptic, S-Y-N, syn is a prefix of synonym, similar, similarity, synonym, optic, the way we see it, viewpoint, similar viewpoint, the synoptic gospels are the gospels written from a similar viewpoint, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the three Gospels that overlap each other in so many of the stories that they tell and the viewpoint that they come at. I wasn't going to talk about that. But I have all kinds of time, so. <clears throat> so I'm going to pause there at the Liturgy of the Word and the conclusion of the Liturgy of the Word comes after the Scriptures are proclaimed and we then profess our faith, the Nicene Creed, which again, much could be said about the many different texts within the Nicene Creed, but the only thing that I'll say about that is how beautiful it is that Christians, ever since the Council of Nicaea in the 4th century, have been professing the same words of faith throughout the centuries within the context of our worship. And that's pretty awesome. And so I challenge you uh, in the context of Sunday Masses and Solemnity Masses when we profess our creed is to think about the reality that these are words that have been proclaimed by saints throughout the centuries and we have the honor, the privilege of saying these words of what we actually believe about our God that has been revealed to us. It's pretty awesome. And then the petitions are meant as the opportunity to lift up our intentions as we prepare ourselves for the liturgy of the Eucharist. These are the things that we should, should be on our hearts that we're praying about as we kneel and come before our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. I said I usually speak for 45 minutes beforehand, but anyway... A couple, of, a couple of words. Everything on this table and everything in terms of the context of the liturgy of the Eucharist that the priest is doing and the gestures and the, the um, positions and such, all of them speak to the reality that this isn't just bread, this isn't just wine, but that through the consecration of the Mass, this becomes the real presence of Jesus Christ, the most miraculous presence of Jesus Christ that we can encounter on this earth. And I can celebrate Mass with a Dixie cup and a paper plate, and it would be valid. 
the reason we use gold and silver and shiny chalices and, and the reason for even just these cloths and adornments and the beauty of vestments, all of those things are tied into the basic fundamental reality of, again, the sacramentality of who we are. And if I'm up here in a raggedy cloth, using a paper plate and a plastic cup, it communicates to you that this isn't any different than a picnic at the beach. But all of the adornment of the sanctuary and all of the adornment of the vessels that are used for Mass, all of them communicate the same, or they're intended to communicate the same reality, which is this is not just bread, this is not just wine, this is not just something that we should handle like any other thing. That's what this is, this is called the burbs. And it's traditionally something that was used as a special carrying case for this, which is the corporal. It comes from the same word as corpus, body or flesh. And so it is a cloth devoted, placed upon the altar during the consecration that is intended for one purpose, which is to catch particles of Jesus that might fall when the priest is handling the elements of bread as it's becoming the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. And so it's folded in a particular way from outside in so that it would not dump any of the particles that would be contained. And it's placed in its own separate, special carrying case, again, not because it's required, but because it communicates to us that this is not just a, this is not just a cotton swab, but that it possesses the true presence of Jesus Christ. Same with the veil. We veil things that carry a dignity and a beauty. I always joke about that. I, well, I don't always joke about it, but I've joked, joked about that with the bride, the tradition of veiling the bride, because you don't want to look at that, right? It's gross. Cover her up. Sorry. Obviously not. But those things that we veil carry an immense beauty and dignity so that as human beings we're, we're drawn into a mystery and a, a question of what I wonder I wonder what's under there. I mean in a very sort of childlike way I wonder what's under there. And so that with the unveiling of those things again it draws the significance of what those things are and the chalice that's used for Mass that possesses the blood of Christ and the patent that holds the body of Christ. And then this Paul, chalice Paul, is actually very practical. It covers the chalice so no junk gets in there because we believe it's Jesus. And so we don't want any other impurities getting into the chalice, and so it's covering the chalice in a very sort of basic and practical way. Got no time. Last thing I'll say before the vestments. I know one of the questions that I get, and it's in the exact same vein as what I've been talking about, is some, some people see that I hold my fingers like this after the consecration. It's not, it's not required. Um, it's something that was part of the extraordinary form uh, prior to the Novus Ordo, a gesture. Um, but it's actually extremely just practical in a sense. Is that if this is Jesus, Again, every particle of the sacred host is fully and truly Jesus. Every visible particle. And so, after I've handled the sacred host, after it's been consecrated, I keep my fingers closed. And 
until, they, until I've had a chance to purify them. Because technically, if I open them up, I could be flinging particles of Jesus all over the place. It's, a, in a sense, a very practical thing. It's something that speaks immensely to me because it speaks to the reality that I can't, I can't touch this in the same way that I touch my supper. I can't touch this in the same way that I touch anything else. If it is what we say we, what we say we believe it is, and I, and I use that as an opportunity for reflection for yourself when you come forward to receive Him. Do we think about that? The, the, the normative way of, re, of reception of communion, still, to this day, the normative way of receiving communion is actually to receive on the tongue. The exception that was allowed to certain churches, including the United States Church, was to receive in the hand. So it is an acceptable way to receive our Lord. At the very least, if you do receive in the hand, considering the fact that all of these things are communicating that this is not just bread, is at the very least that we're paying attention, if we're receiving in the hand, that we're paying attention to possible particles, because it's fully, truly Jesus. That it's something that's actually crossing our mind as we approach our Lord to receive Him. Every vestment that the priest has has a special prayer that's prayed, and so as I vest, and I'll have the servers come up and light the candles. I don't usually get dressed in front of the public eye. There's a beauty, there's a beauty even to the, oh, I need this. There's a beauty even to the vestments that the priest wears. This is called the amis, which has both, all of, all of the vestments kind of have a, a practical origin as well as a spiritual origin. Um, the practical is that it covers sort of the dirtiest part of the, the priest that keeps the rest of the vestments from getting like the ring around the collar, the oils and the dirt that a priest would have, so that's the practical. The spiritual is it's actually called the helmet, the helmet of salvation. And it in a tim, in a sense covers the soul of the priest in the spiritual battle that he enters into as he celebrates the Mass. And so the prayer is Place upon me, O Lord, the helmet of salvation, that I may overcome the assaults of the devil. I'm just thinking to myself, if you, for just a future reference, future note to myself, was to not do the teaching mass. Right after the week I was on silent retreat. Because I'm all fired up. <laughs> full of words that I didn't get to say last week. So I don't usually go this long on the front end of it. And the owl, which is the white garment, symbolic of the white garment, in a sense, symbolic of the white garment given to us in our baptism, is also the, the symbol of the white garment given to Christ. And it also symbolizes purity so that the priest is clothed in purity as he celebrates the sacred liturgy.
cincture. Is gird me, O Lord, with the cincture of purity and quench in my heart the fire of concupiscence, that the virtue of continence and chastity may abide in me. And so it symbolizes the commitment of chastity of the priest. The stole is perhaps the most universal sign of the priesthood, and so the stole is typically worn by the priest in the context of all of the sacraments. The prayer is, Lord, restore the stole of immortality which I lost through the collusion of our first parents, and unworthy as I am to approach your sacred mysteries, may I yet gain eternal joy.
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who with his great mercy gave us a new birth to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. By the power of God, our safeguarded through faith to a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the final time. This you rejoice, although now for a little while you may have to suffer through various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that is perishable even though tested by fire, may prove to be for praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Although you have not seen him, you love him. Even though you do not see him now, yet you believe in him, you rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy as you attain the goal of faith, the salvation of your souls. The word of the Lord thanks be to God. The Lord will remember his covenant.
used it, I've already used it my homily time. Um, so I'm going to speak to one thing, and then I'm going to continue with the Mass, and we'll conclude the Mass, and then those of you who uh, need to get going are certainly welcome after, after a short Thanksgiving after Mass to do so, and then I'll kind of wrap up uh, after that, so obviously it's going to go a little, a little bit longer. So. The one thing that I wanted to speak to is, in a very bit, very basic way, the purpose of the Mass. And this is something, actually, uh, there's a, a talk by Father Mike Schmitz, uh, who, if you've heard of him, he does the Bible in a Year podcast, and he gave a, he gave a talk at one of the SEEP conferences a number of years ago, and basically spoke about the Mass, and he spoke to the reality of the purpose of the Mass is somewhat can be somewhat lost because of the fact that we, we tend to come to Mass, even from the earliest stages of our lives as children. And when we're, in the, when we're in the pew, and we might be screwing around, and mom or dad, you know, taps us on the ear, pulls the ear, and says, experience that. Watch. Watch what Father's doing. And so whether consciously or subconsciously, even from the earliest stages, we have a tendency to come to Mass to watch. As I made reference to at the beginning, as if it were some drama that we were sitting in an auditorium observing. It's not the purpose of the Mass, is to watch what the priest is doing at the altar. It's actually, as I made reference to as well, in your priesthood as baptized, what is the role of the priesthood? There is only one role of the priesthood throughout the, well, I mean, there's lots, lots of smaller roles, but the significant role of the priest in the Old Testament was to offer the sacrifice. Offer the sacrifice. I never put the microphone underneath my album, and it's really weird. I never mess while I'm trying to talk in the microphone. Anyways. In just a few moments, I'm going to say, pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours, which is a reference to your priesthood, that as I made reference to your, your offering of prayer, your offering of worship, you're, you're participating in what's happening here. Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. And if you're good Catholics, you should, there should be something well enough within you right now, and you're like, wow, I have a, I have a line. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands. Why? Two reasons. For the praise and glory of his name, and for the good of the Holy Church. I butchered it. It's not my life, it's your life. For our good and the good of all his Holy Church. That's the purpose of the Mass. That I'm offering sacrifice as the presider, the president of the liturgy, but that you too are participating in offering sacrifice for your good and the good of all his holy church, as well as for the glorification of his name, to give glory and honor to God. And it's not just a, you're sitting there, hopefully the priest is good this week and he's got something to catch my attention. And hopefully the scriptures maybe catch me or something, maybe something interesting will happen. But it is, you are offering the highest possible form of prayer that we can offer and you're participating in the priest who is leading us in that worship. 
Father Michael also talks about this, which is kind of a hot topic in the church today, which is one of the reasons why we've lost a sense of that, and it's become more about watching the priest, is because he's standing behind the altar and he's facing you, and in some cases the priest is even looking at you, which is not technically, that's not how I'm praying. These prayers are not written, directed to you. No offense. Prayers that I'm praying at the altar are, are directed to the Father. And so, for centuries within the context of the liturgy, the priest, yes, he had his back to the people. That's how people reference it now. That's not the core of what the priest is doing. Do you say, I was riding the bus? The bus driver was so rude because he had his back to us. I hope the bus driver is not driving the bus looking at you. And so some of the reason that we've lost a sense of that you're participating in the offering of the sacrifice is because even just the physical disposition is for you to be seated watching. The presider technically is the one leading the procession and also the one directing the prayer to the Father. And yeah, it's an allowance that has taken place in the church, but I think in some ways it's led us to, to a little bit of where we are. I hope I'm engaged. I hope it, I hope it catches my interest. I hope it's entertaining. If that's our disposition, I assure you it's going to be boring. But if we come with the anticipation and the expectation that I'm here to offer a specific prayer, to offer a sense of worship in my priesthood, to participate with the priest who is leading me, and that as he's standing at the altar, he's offering his prayer to the Father in the direction of the crucifix, one of the remnants of that is sometimes I'll have the ladies who are, who are decorating the church and changing out the altar cloths. They'll, they'll put the cross back on and they'll, and they'll face it like a normal crucifix, right? People should be able to see Jesus. This crucifix is not for your benefit. Sorry. This is my crucifix. But it is. The reason why there's a crucifix on the altar is because my prayer is not directed to you. My prayer is the prayer of Mount Calvary that I'm participating in the sacrifice that Jesus offered on the cross. And so my directed prayer is to the crucifix, to Jesus. And so I want to be able to see Jesus. And that, again, was already set up that way when the priest was facing the crucifix. I know, it, like I said, it's a politically hot topic. part of the boredom of the mass. Because if we're just here to watch what the priest is doing behind the altar, not that entertaining. But if we realize that we're participating with him in our offering of sacrifice, in participation in Calvary, and that he's leading us in that direction, I think it can take on a different But it also should just, even with the priest facing us, should draw us into that reminder of what we're doing. For the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. Let us stand in honor of our prayer. to the Lord. 
God, you make these prayers and ask that you hear them and answer them according to your will through Christ our Lord.
class. Um, certainly, you're, you're welcome to leave at that time. We've been already past the 90 minutes, but I'll come back at come back and just wrap up. Hopefully, in 10, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 45. Oh. <laughs> no, I hope, to, hope to be done not too late, much later than that. The Lord be with you. context of the, lit the liturgy of the Eucharist that kind of spoke to the reality in my homily of sort of the mode and what we're actually doing there. Um, sometimes the question comes up, so you guys re-sacrifice Jesus every time you celebrate Mass? And the reality is, you know, uh, as the scriptures say, that was one sacrifice offered for all time. And so the Mass is not a re-sacrifice of Jesus, uh, but it's a, it's a participation in what he calls the eternal sacrifice, uh, the sacrifice for all time. And so it's a representation of what took place uh, on, on our behalf at Calvary in his sacrifice. And so that's the kind of the direction and mode of the liturgy of the Eucharist, that by doing the prayers that he commanded us to do when he, when he said, do this in remembrance of me, which seems like a pretty simple command when it comes to our worship, that yes, we should read from the scriptures, uh, yes, we should offer prayers, uh, yes, we should praise him in song, but there's only one thing at his last supper that he really said, do this in remembrance of me. That's the offering of what we believe to be the bread and wine, um, which becomes his body, blood, soul, and divinity. So obviously it's the core, the prayers of the altar, the core of the sacrifice uh, of the Mass. It's the sort of the culmination or combination of what happened at the Last Supper and his offering of the sacrifice for all time. So many gestures, so many actions, so many activities within the context of the liturgy of the Eucharist that I won't and I don't have the time to get into as of right now. But all of the all of the prayers, including like the song twos, uh, one of my favorite prayers, uh, the holy, 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 that it is again direct quotations from the scriptures, but a participation with the angels and their prayer in the scriptures. 
scriptures, uh, when they sing holy, 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 so too do we, um, right before we fall on our knees in adoration. So it's kind of a beautiful moment that we participate with the angels in that moment and then fall on our knees. Um, one of those, why don't I pause for a moment and just see if there was any, any questions that came up, uh, things that maybe you saw, they were like, oh, he didn't talk about that, or um, moments or things that struck you, or, yeah. That's a good question. So his question was, do I ever get hot wearing all of the vestment? And it's, a, it's actually an interesting thing because we wear black. We wear black in the summertime. We, uh, black is absorbent of the, of the sun and the light. Um, it's interesting because one, one of the beautiful things about the human body is it's super adaptive and it actually adapts to the environments in which you place it. And so while it's hot at times, I don't really think about it because it's just what I wear. And so, yeah, I think probably I get hot, but I don't think I got I get as hot as maybe I once did uh, because our bodies are super adaptive. I mean, it used to be that people, like men, wore three-piece suits like everywhere out in public back in the day, uh, and it would have been super hot. Uh, but. It's just what everybody did, and you get used to it, and your body adapts, so. Glad you asked. Any other questions? One of the questions that comes up is, why do we always repeat everything? Holy, 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 Lamb of God, Lamb of God, Lamb of God. Um, fault, fault, most grievous fault. It's like all these triples. We got all these triples. So, in the ancient languages, um, as far as my understanding goes, there is no imperative in the same way that we have in English. So in English, we just add an ending onto a word to intensify the word, like fast, faster, fastest. Uh, in the ancient languages, that is not the case. So in order to communicate faster, something would be repeated twice. And in order to communicate fastest, Times. And so we're saying, by saying holy, 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 uh, fault, fault, most grievous fault, we're striving to communicate the fullness of holiness, the fullness of sorrow for our sins, and that's why we, that's why we do things three times. So, yeah, it's funny because there's so many little things like that that I think are like super interesting. And yet, you don't necessarily hear about that. Maybe you didn't learn that. I didn't learn that. So, but there's meaning behind everything. Yeah. What about the repetition of the rosary? Is it merely meditation? Yeah, so his question is about the rosary um, and the repetition of the rosary. So that one is not the same sense of imperative. Uh, but the rosary is a meditation, as you know, on the, on the life of Christ, the mysteries that surround the life of Christ, the birth, uh, all the way through his ascension into heaven, um, including, obviously, as we know, the, the assumption and the crowning of Mary as queen. Um, so all of those are intended to be the meditation of the prayers, the ten prayers of the Hail Mary. So the repetition of the Hail Mary uh, is really intended to be an opportunity to really enter into a meditation upon the mysteries. One of the beautiful things about the rosary is that there's no, like, I don't know that I would say there's a right way to pray it in the sense that sometimes I feel drawn into meditating on the prayer of the Hail Mary and the fact that we're quoting scripture, the fact that we're asking Mary to pray for us. And some of the Hail Marys, I reflect on that. Other times I focus in on the mystery in depth and try to do that. Other times I have a particular intention that I'm meditating on God and our Blessed Mother drawing the prayers of that, of that intention. So that's why I say there's not a, a right way to pray the Hail Mary. Um, I have 
13 seconds to follow my statement that I would be done by 9. So, just a, a final word of thank you. Thank you for those of you who endured the live stream as well. And for those of you who are here, feel free to... I know I, I spewed so many things, so much information and lots of things, so I am happy that we have the opportunity of the live stream to go back and uh, maybe you're like, I have no desire to sit through this again. <laughs> I know what you're doing. All right, let's close with the prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Loving God, we praise you. We thank you for so many ways that you bless us. We pray that you make us ever mindful of those gifts still within our hearts a desire, a yearning to learn about your mysteries, about our faith, and so to share it with others. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. May Almighty God bless you.